Well, we're going to dive into the Song of Solomon chapter 2 and 3 this morning, so go ahead and open your Bible. If you brought one, go into your phone. If you have a Bible app, Solomon, Song of Solomon, Song of Songs chapter 2 and 3. And by the way, if you speak fluent French, this is unrelated to the message entirely, but if you speak fluent French, please see me right after the message, okay? If you speak fluent French. If you've not read the Song of Solomon, um, it'll make you blush. Uh, It is really intense. So if you were not here last week, a little bit of a background, uh, written about a thousand years before uh, Christ, uh, the rabbis in the Jewish, um, uh, in in Israel, had no problem inserting it into the Bible. Sometimes it raises questions, why is a book like this in the Bible? And yet it was read at Passover. Um, uh, in the Jewish uh, faith. In fact, the rabbis call it the Holy of Holies. Um, and they had no trouble uh, believing this was, this was the Word of God, but it's very, very intense. Uh, there's two ways that people have interpreted this book. One is they see it as an allegory, a beautiful allegory of the love of God for Israel, the love of Christ for His church. Other people have seen this as the, as the passionate pursuit of a man and a woman for one another and the love they have for one another of, of, uh, of a man pursuing a woman uh, before they get married and then they get married and there's the honeymoon and then life uh, in marriage. And that's the way we're going to look at it uh, today for uh, several reasons, one of which marriages are in trouble today. Uh, we all know that. And quite frankly, the enemy of our souls, our spiritual enemy is doing so much damage in marriage and I'm sick of it and we're sick of it. And we're praying that we'll take back some ground, at, le- at least in our church among the people who are here, some spiritual ground, by going into God's Word and seeing what He says about marriage. Another reason is it's hard to look at television or a billboard or go into a grocery store or go onto the internet without seeing a distortion of what God teaches about sexuality. And by looking at, and because of our own natural desires and because of what we're surrounded in our culture with, um, the pressure that we're under makes it very difficult to live with any kind of purity in our lives. And so by going into the Song of Solomon, we get a very different picture. We get God's picture of sexuality. So we're looking at the Song of Solomon to try to recalibrate our thinking. So Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 2. And we're going to put one verse on the screen. I really want us to use our Bibles this morning. But I'm going to ask you to read with me kind of a theme verse for today, Uh, chapter 2, verse 15. Would you read this with me out loud? In fact, let's stand together. We all kind of get some breath in our lungs. And let's read this out loud together. Read with me. Catch the foxes for us. Let's all read it together, shall we? (laughs) Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. Thank you. Great job. Be seated. So here's the idea. Little foxes would come in at night, these little animals would come in at night, and they would go into the vineyards of Israel, and before the grapes could develop, when when the vineyards were still in blossom, the foxes would eat the blossoms, ruining the vineyards. And what this, we're not sure if it's a man talking or a woman talking at this point, what they're saying is, this happens in relationships, and it's not the big problems that blow marriages up. Many times marriages can absorb those kinds of problems, some hidden life that a partner has. It's amazing. I've seen, I've seen marriages survive in spite of the, the worst kinds of disasters that develop in marriages. Amazingly, marriages can take a long time, redevelop trust. It's the little things that just kind of eat away at the inner lining of marriages that ruin marriages, that spoil marriages. And so what we're going to look at today from the Song of Solomon are some of those little things that we don't notice, like foxes that come out at night, little foxes, little things that, that eat away at marriages that we don't pay attention to. And before we know it, they've, they've eaten away at the inner lining, at the infrastructure of a marriage, and the marriage is damaged. And, what it's, and this is not an entertaining sermon. This is a call to action. This is a call to vigilance because he says, catch the foxes 
for us. This is a call to pay attention to our, our marriages, as he says. So you have your Bible open. I'm going to give you six. If I, get in, if I have enough time, we're going to look at six of those little, little foxes, little things in marriage that grow into big annoyances that spoil the vineyard, spoil the marriages, damage our marriages. So here's the first one. And actually, the, book of, uh, the Song of Solomon begins with a young couple who are in love. They are having fun together. They're pursuing one another. They're growing in their relationship. They're not yet married. They're romancing. And if you were here last week, we, we took a look at what that looked like, and, and you remember that. Um, they're deeply in love. Chapter 2, verse 5, Song of Solomon. She says, uh, sustain me with raisins or raisin cakes. You remember what that was you heard last week? Some of you are blushing right now. Sustain, raisins or raisin cakes was the, the ancient Hebrew version of, it was an aphrodisiac. He has so wooed her. He has so courted her. He has so given her attention. She wants him. She's, she is so in love with him. They're not married but she wants to give herself to him. And she says, sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. She just, she just wants him. And so she says, and maybe he's at the door of her house, kissing her goodnight. He says, she says, his left hand is under my head. His right hand embraces me. You get the picture? He's going to kiss her goodnight. And she says, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it's, it's time, until it pleases. So she's saying, I want you with everything in me, but it's not yet time. Don't stir up love. She's going to say this three different times in this book. Look at chapter 2, verse 15, vast passage we just read. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in, in blossom. And the very next verse, my beloved is mine and I am his. We belong to each other. We're made for each other. They're still not married yet. He's mine. I am his. He grazes among the lilies. What does that mean? Well, in chapter 5, verse 13, she likens his lips to lilies. So she's talking about his lips. He grazes among the lilies. He's kissing me. I want you to know that what she feels for him and what he feels for her before they're married is good. It's right. It's biblical. It's holy. There's nothing wrong with it. They're not yet married. They feel passion and longing for each other. They just know they can't hit the switch yet. They can't give in yet. To use the language of this book, they can't yet awaken love because it's, the grapes have not ripened yet. They want to build their relationship on tenderness, on holiness, on rightness. Now let me use the language of today. Most couples don't think twice about sex before marriage. Most couples today blow their marriages up. So let me just talk as straight as I know how. If you want what everyone, and I'm speaking to couples that are not married, if you want what everyone else has, then do what everyone else does. If you want what few people have, then do what few people do. See, in dating, you have two choices. You have two options, really only two. Option one is you mutually decide you will honor God by waiting until marriage to be sexually intimate. That's option one. Option two is you mutually agree to sin together. Those are the only two options. And the question is on what foundation you will build your life together. You'll either honor God together or you will dishonor God before you're married. Those are the only two options. And I can look you all in the eye, and I can say one of the reasons Ruthie and I have the kind of marriage that we have is we agreed before marriage to keep God's standard. You say, was that easy? Are you kidding? No, it was not easy. In fact, at our wedding reception, 
while they were passing out the cake and, and all, I leaned over and whispered to Ruthie and I said, they can eat their cake by themselves. Let's go. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, in essence, not using these words, she said, let's not awaken love till it's time. <laughs> in other words, no, let's not go yet. So I'm going to tell you what happened. Uh, after a while, we left and we went to a hotel and I opened the door and I carried her across the threshold into the room. I set her down and I prayed for her and me. And that's all I'm going to tell you about that night. But one of the reasons we have the kind of marriage that we have is we decided beforehand, as we were dating, we were going to keep God's standard of holiness. If you're a single, you've got to make that decision one way or another. Now, some of us are married and we go, well, uh, we missed that one, didn't we? I mean, we blew that one. I'm not here to heap guilt on anybody at all. We can't go back and we can't change the past. But I have known couples, I have known couples over the years who have said to one another, we need to ask God for forgiveness. And we need to go back and just say, Lord, uh, we didn't keep your standard and we want to apologize and receive your forgiveness. And I have actually known husbands who have said to their wives, if I had known then what I do know now, I would not have done what I did. And I want to ask you to forgive me. I've actually known husbands who have said that. I would have acted differently. From this day forward, regardless of what has happened in premarital counseling, I sit down with couples and I say, one of the conditions I have for doing your wedding is whatever you have done up until this moment, from this moment on, my condition is you will not be sexually intimate with one another and you bow before me, you bow before God, and you bow before each other. I won't, you will not be sexually intimate. You will honor God because you want God's blessing on your marriage from this moment on. And so wherever, wherever you are right now, you can make that statement from this moment on by God's strength and with his help. We want to honor God. We want to build a foundation that honors him. That's one of the little foxes before you get married. Here's the second Fox from this book, and that's a neglect of intimacy. Look at chapter two, verse eight. This is this is uh, this is a little fun. Verse eight: the, They're not married yet, and this is the woman speaking. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. This is a woman who she's just got the perfectionist view of of her uh, spouse. Here he comes, leaping over the mountains. <laughs> She can, he can't wait to be with her. Verse 9, my beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. My wife today would look, my wife today would look at me and she would say, he's an old stag, but wh whatever. Behold, he stands there behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. You would say, that's creepy. What, what's he doing? He's playing peekaboo. He's having fun with her, and she loves it. He's peekaboo. It's just, it's just kind of being romantic. Verse 10, my beloved speaks and says to me, arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain's over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. He's saying, it's gorgeous outside. You're so beautiful. Let's go for a walk. Let's go out in the country time. What time is it? It's springtime. Let's go out for a walk. You look so pretty. Can we go out for a walk? Let's do. Let's keep reading. Verse 13, the fig tree ripens its figs. The vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Oh, rise, my love, my beautiful one. Come away. Oh, my dove in the clefts of the rock and the crannies of the cliff. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyard. For our vineyards are in blossom. I remember the days when Ruthie and I were dating, and uh, remember the landlines, days of landlines? Anybody still have a landline in your home? A few of us. Remember the days on landlines when you were dating and you didn't want to hang up with each other? I remember Ruthie and I, we were talking about it last night. Uh, you hang up first. No, you hang up first. Uh, all right, on the count of three, we're going to hang up. One, two, three. You still there? Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> all right, I'm going to hang up, Okay. You didn't hang up. No, I didn't hang up. We don't want to hang up. 
just this little fun banter going on with, with, with one another. Fast forward five years into the marriage. What happens? Kids happen. The career happens. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. What happens to those walks? What happens to the peekaboo? What happens to the picnics? Marriage happens. Does it have to be that way? Duties, responsibilities. Can you not have romance? Can you not have fun? Sure you can. It takes a little bit of work, but what happens? I'll tell you what happens. There's something in a man's mind that says this. I've got to get the marriage job done. And in order to get the marriage job done, I've got to be romantic. I've got to be creative. I've got to woo this woman. I've got to court this woman. I've got to do what it takes to get the marriage job done. Done. You see, he's been trained this way. When a little boy uh, is growing up and he's, he, he plays sports, he plays uh, football. And after the football season is over, he hangs up his cleats and he, puts, he plays basketball. So he puts basketball shoes on and gets the uniform and he goes and plays basketball. And when basketball season's over, he puts off the basketball shoes and it's baseball season. So he puts on basket, his baseball shoes and goes out. And when bas- baseball season's over, it's the next sport. He is trained to move from one thing to another. And so it's time to get married. I do what I need to do to get married. And he doesn't mean anything by it, but I need to get the marriage job done. So I, t- I, I woo my wife. I love this woman. And I, I'm romantic and I do what I need to do to, to get it done. But when I get the marriage job done, it's time to move to the next thing, the career. I got to get the career going. I got to get this, or I got to get my education. I got to get it going. Now put yourself in the, wi- in the, in the, in the shoes of the, of, the, of the wife. She's been burned before. She's had her heart broken before. And so here comes this guy, and he begins to woo her and treat her in a special way. And she's very suspicious. What's going to happen? She's thinking forward. Am I going to get my heart broken again? What is he really after? But he keeps after her and keeps after her, and he's so nice and he's so polite and he's listening to her. And she's thinking, how long, when's the other shoe gonna drop? How long before he breaks my heart? But he keeps on and he's so genuine. And pretty soon he wears her defenses down until the point she really believes he wants me. I have his heart. He's after my heart. He, he um, asked for her hand in marriage. She agrees. There's the engagement. There's the wedding. There's the honeymoon. She is dreaming. This is the way life is going to be. And sometime after the honeymoon, she wakes up and realizes it's bait and switch. He has moved on. His job now has his heart. His career has his heart. And she begins to think his employees have his fun, his creativity, his spontaneity, his planning, all of his life goes into his job. What was happening with her now is happening with work. And she wakes up thinking, it has happened. My worst nightmare. Neglect of intimacy. Neglect of romance. Neglect of a heart being given. So she comes home and she says, how was your day? And she really wants to know, how was your day? What, what went on? And he says, fine. No, I mean, what was your, how was your day? And he doesn't understand. And she says, you don't love me. I do love you. I provide for you. I'm here. And he is confusing being by her with being with her. And he doesn't understand at all. He doesn't mean anything by it. He really doesn't understand. What is intimacy? Look at verse 14 once again. Oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rocks, in the crannies of the cliffs, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. Someone defined intimacy as into you I see. Into your heart. I want to hear your voice. I want to look into my eyes. When was it, married folks, when was the last time you went out for breakfast and you put the phone down and you looked into each other's eyes and heard each other's voice and heard each other's hearts? When was the last time you shared your fears and your worries and your dreams? When was the last time you you shared your plans? 
You go, well, I'm, I'm just not romantic. Yes, you were when you were a little boy. Yes, you were. That's the way you got her. You did not become a cyborg intentionally. It's one of those little foxes that just creeps in without you knowing it. And I'll, I'll go one more step further. If you have secrets in your marriage, if you are withholding something in your marriage from one another, you do not have the intimacy that God designed for marriage. You, do, you, you cannot see into one another's hearts. You cannot look each other in the eye. It's one of those little foxes, neglect of intimacy. Let me go to a third one real quickly. And that is idolatry. Look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. The woman is dreaming. Actually, she's having a nightmare. On my bed at night, I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him but found him not. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him but found him not. The watchmen found me as they went about in the city. Have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I passed him when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and I would not let him go until I brought him into my mother's house, into the chamber of her who conceived me. They said, what is, what is that about? Well, she thinks she's lost Solomon. She thinks she's lost her, 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 her husband, her lover. And she finds him in her dream and she brings him to her mother's house because in that culture, that's a way of saying, I want you to be committed to me to be a part of my life, and we'll find out in just a moment why, why the mother, it's a way of asking for commitment. And she won't let him go. She's holding on to him. I've noticed that when women come to a certain point in their life, post-college sometimes, there is this great fear that they're not going to get married. They cannot imagine life as a single. And sometimes they become very desperate. And it shows up in nightmares and it turns the love of a man into an idol. You see, an idol is taking something good and making it ultimate, making it God, making it something you must have to be happy. And what's, what you should have in God, you look for in something or someone else. Happiness, success, acceptance, security, and so rather than seeing a spouse as a gift from God and loving the giver, thanking the giver, you focus on the gift rather than the giver. And that's idolatry. Listen to Angela Thomas. Here's one thing I can say with great confidence. She's speaking to women. The man you love is just a man. He may be your soulmate, possibly your best friend. He may be funny and surprising and strong, but he will never, not in a million years, be enough to fill your soul. He will never make you whole. He wasn't made to be enough. He couldn't be even if he tried. He's just a man. He can only give you what a man can give. He can only interact as a man, love as a man. He wasn't designed to fill the depth of a woman's longings. He can't. Those deep places inside you were made for God. The man is simply a vessel. God uses him to give you only a part of his holy love. He's not the only vessel. He is not able to fill you from his own strength, nor is he the only thing you will ever need. Are you hearing this? There will never be a man on the face of the earth who can make you whole. Being filled in the depths of your soul is only about the love of God. The man's responsibility is to be a vessel and to be a good one. Your responsibility is to let him be just that. He is not your girlfriend. He is not perfect. And he will never be. He is not your savior. And he is not the answer to all your longings. I hope you've heard me. A good man can be wonderful, but he can never be enough. And he can never make you whole. You and I were made for more. You were made for God. Did you ever see the movie Jerry Maguire? You say, yeah, but I'm not telling anybody. In that movie, there's that scene where Tom Cruise looks at the woman and he says, you complete me. If anyone ever says to you, you complete me, run for the hills. You never want to marry a man who says, you complete me. You never want to marry Tom Cruise, that's for sure. But if you, 
If a man ever says to you, you complete me, he will be like a drowning man you throw a life preserver to, and he will take you down with him. He will suck you dry. He will depend on you for everything. Lonely, insecure, single people become lonely, insecure, married people. Only Jesus Christ can complete you. He's just a man. Number four, isolation. If you look at chapter 3, verses 6 through 8, here's the wedding. Here's the wedding party coming along. Let's go through this real quickly. Verse 6, chapter 3. What is that coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the fragrant powders of a merchant? Behold, it's the litter or the bed of Solomon. Around it are 60 mighty men, some of the mighty men of Israel, all of them wearing swords and experts in war, each with his sword at his thigh against the terror of, of night. So this is the wedding procession of Solomon. It sounds like a redneck wedding, you know, 60 guys with shotguns coming along. Uh, the, the wedding procession, and she is just wowed by it, not because of all the 60 guys. With it's for her to protect her. It, it goes on to say, um, verse 9, King Solomon made himself a carriage from the wood of Lebanon. He made its post of silver, its back of gold, its seat of, of purple. Its interior was inlaid with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go out, O daughters of Zion, and look upon King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. Here's the fourth thing, isolation. Here's King Solomon coming to his wedding, and he is surrounded by 60 of his best friends. Do you know why you invite your best friends to a wedding? It's not simply that they might share your joy. It's that they might hold you accountable to your vows. And what happens in marriage is we get separated from our friends, especially we guys, and we get ourselves in isolation. And I'm so grateful that I've had friends in my life when I make decisions who sometimes will come to me and say, are you really thinking of yourself or are you th including Ruthie in your thinking? I'm so glad God has surrounded us with friends from time to time. And I don't like to hear that, but I'm so grateful that God has surrounded us with friends. But guys many times will isolate themselves. And isolation is a horrible thing. Not only isolation from friends, but uncut apron strings. That's another little fox. There's a reference to Solomon's mother placing a crown on his head. And that's not the crown of the king of Israel. In ancient Israel, a mother would put a crown on uh, the head of the groom, indicating you are now the king of your house. You're the king. This is a way of saying you're now the husband she, it's like the father walking the bride down. You're the king of your house. She is your bride. It's, it's separating. You have your own family. You're, you're set up. And what happens today, the little fox that gets in, is there is no separation from mom and dad. And as clearly and as lovingly as I know how, I want to say a, a clear word what I'm hearing and what I'm reading and what I'm seeing is that many times one of the greatest problems that takes place in Christian marriages is moms especially will not let go. Moms and dads will not let go. A man is to leave his father and his mother. And that means dependence has to let go. That means allegiance to parents has to be filtered through, and now this young couple has to form their own family. Ruthie and I have done that with our four kids as they've been married, and we have said to them, you are your own family. You decide when you visit. We want you to visit, and we've, we've taken each one of our children out. When they told us, when they asked, we, we said we, we, we'd like to marry, and We've given them our blessing, and we've taken each of them out for a, a, a really nice meal. And I've told the, the girls who married our sons, and I've told the guys who married our two daughters. And I've said, Ruthie and I are making you a promise. We will never give you unsolicited advice. And every time they thought, thank you. Now, we're happy to give you advice if you ask us. We will never give you unsolicited advice. You have your own home. You've got to set up your own home. 
One of the best things, I th- and this came from counsel from someone else, one of the best things I, th- I think that we have done, we've set a crown on the head and said, you're the king and you are the queen. And sometimes we've had to bite our tongue. Sometimes it's been very difficult. In many cultures, this is symbolized when a boy turns uh, 12 and the young men, will, the men of the village will come and take away a boy. And the mother knows it, but she plays along and she starts screaming, my boy, my boy, I'm my boy. And the boy will go, mama, mama, mama. And they, the men take him away. And at age 12 or 13, he's considered now a man. Jesus, when he performs his first miracle, has his mother come to him and says, They're, they've run out of wine. And what does he say to her? Woman, what does that have to do with me? The apron strings have been cut. It's necessary. Sometimes it's so hard, but it's so necessary. And you say, but doesn't the Bible say you have to honor your parents? Absolutely, it does say that. But it never says to a married man or woman, you have to obey your parents. You honor them. You honor them by being the man or woman of God that you need to be. But parents, we have to let them go. We have to let them develop their own home and make their own decisions. It's absolutely critical. And one of the little foxes that gets in is an uncut apron string. So when I do a wedding, sometimes I'll reverse the way a wedding coordinator has set it up where a a, a father and a a bride come down, and I insist that the father come down on the side, on the right side of the bride where he stands between the groom and the bride so that he literally has to put the bride's hand into the groom's hand and then step back, get out of the way and sit down. So it's very evident, symbolic, very clear. He's now away. And this is the new couple. It's a biblical pattern. Separation has to take place. Okay. You've got you got the friends there, parents have separated, not the new couple. That it? Is anybody else there at the wedding? Is there, is there one other person there? I think there is. There is one illusion. illusion. Look back at verse 6, chapter 3. What is that coming up from the wilderness like columns or pillars of smoke? Any Jew reading this would think instantly, go back in his mind to the exodus, to the wilderness wanderings, to the pillar of smoke that guided the Israelites, to the pillar of fire at night. I believe this is an allusion to God himself there at the wedding, giving his blessing at the wedding. And so the last little fox is what I call spiritual indifference. Even Solomon reminded us of this in Ecclesiastes 4 when he said a threefold cord is not easily broken. And so when I do a wedding, I remind the bride, when you make a braid, you know, it looks like there's only two strands, but really it takes three strands to make a wedding. There's a husband and the wife, and there is God. And so a marriage that is solid requires three persons, not two. And there's the Lord. And he's involved. And you say, well, how is God involved? And a lot of people think you involve God in a wedding simply because you had your wedding in a church. And that's like the Grammy Awards when some person has won a Grammy for some filthy, profane song and they stand there and say, I'd like to thank my producer and oh, I want to thank God. And God said, I don't think so. That's a filthy song. No, it's not because you've had a wedding in a church building. What does it mean to involve God in your as the center of your your marriage. It means God is the one who fulfills you. I don't look to Ruthie to make me happy. I look to Jesus. Ruthie's a gift to me. but It's Jesus who makes me happy. It means that God is the pattern of how I love her and she loves me. Jesus loved me when I'm not worthy. Ruthie loves me when I'm not worthy of her love. People get divorced because they're not compatible, because of irreconcilable differences. Jesus and I have all kinds of irreconcilable differences. He loves me anyway. That's the pattern. Jesus gives me the power and the strength to love and to lead and to forgive. Jesus gives us something to live for beyond ourselves. Let me give you a statistic you may not be aware of. 
People who are very much in love discover love is not enough. The current divorce rate, and there's all kinds of statistics and arguments about what the current divorce rate is. Some say 55%, some say 42 to 45%, depends on who you read. But the divorce rate somewhere between 40 and 50%. The University of Columbia, Columbia University up in New York City did a st- survey several years ago. It's been done several times since then that when people read, when couples read their Bible and pray together, the divorce rate jumps to 1 in 1,050. You ought to write that down. That's less than 1, that's less than 0.1%. I think that means if you're going to involve God in your family, you become a church-going family. And husband, that means it begins with you. You say, we're going to be a church-going family. We're not going to be a stay-at-home family. Stay-at-home families rarely raise go-to-church kids. Means we're going to honor God with our family. And I want you to take a few moments and watch this video of one of the families in our church, Jason and Mandy Grant. Jason's one of our deacons. Watch this video. We met on eHarmony. It actually does work sometimes. I was on vacation with a friend, and we had decided to make it a no boys weekend. And so we weren't going to talk to guys, we weren't going to do anything, we were just going to have fun together as girls. And I was sitting on my bed in my hotel room, she was on her bed, and I opened up my eHarmony and he had did a communication. And I went, oh, he's cute. (laughs) And so I started reading and what really um, made me excited is that he was saying that he was a godly leader and that's what I was looking for and that he was looking for a godly leader. I'm like, oh, we respect that I'm a leader. Okay, this is great. And he wants a godly person and he wanted to communicate right away. And I told him I wouldn't, he couldn't call until I got back from my girls week. And he called when I got home, the night I got home and we talked every day since. We traveled back and forth for uh, almost a year and we met and married within within that year of dating. We knew, we knew right away. Yeah, I remember her telling me to wait until she got back. And, uh, you know, it was a wonderful experience. And and I must acknowledge that that prior to that, you know, I was, I had failed relationships because I realized I was looking for a mom to kind of heal some wounds there um, rather than a a godly woman and a partner. In my family, there was a shift when I was 12. And, you know, we had a a breakdown in the family and uh, some of the family members, uh, did not follow God's advice on how we should handle those and, and it resulted in some substance abuse and and uh, some trauma in the family and so it was some painful pruning to get through that process to make sure that I was okay and ready to move into to, to a marriage and, and lead a family based on God's words and principles. And so I just made sure that I put something in place to be harmony without any filters and those filters were to focus on who God wants me to be with and um, just trying to find that godly woman uh, that I could partner with. We based our marriage and we based all of our decisions on our covenant. And um, Jason said when we were engaged, hey, we need, we need to have a covenant for our, for our wedding. And I thought, I just can't even imagine just coming up with a short, concise covenant. And so we said, you know what, we're gonna each develop our own we're gonna to come together, we're gonna to see where we where we match up. This was by far the easiest, most aligned conversation I think we've ever had. We came together, we had almost identical points. And so you can see it's God first, our home is a safe refuge, and we're committed to, um, to really using our gifts and resources to serve others and further God's kingdom. We live this every day. This is part of our decisions. This is part of every conversation. This is part of our entire way that we frame our family. And I've been journaling ever since, ever since we we got married. And uh, you know, I start that start the day by saying, "Hey, how am I putting God first? How am I using His Word to, to make decisions?" And I document those things, and then I move into the next category: Is our home safe? not only just the physical component, but the the emotional and the mental pieces of that, and then how we frame the protect, frame decisions to protect our family. And then after that, I think that's those two key foundational points are, are we using our gifts and resources once we have those two pieces in order to further God's kingdom? And, um, you know, every Saturday we have a meeting 
Uh, each morning we get together and talk about what we're reading. And uh, it's just been an evolution of pruning, but also uh, spiritual growth. Uh, and this has been the, been the guiding principle that has, I think, got us to this point. We've only been married for six years, and I think we've had enough challenges to write a book. One of the first things we encountered in our marriage uh, was a miscarriage, and we've had three. And um, those are hard. Those are really hard. Uh, but in that, I think we learned how to be sensitive to each other, how to grieve and mourn, um, but also how to give God glory. It helps us appreciate our kids even more. Um, that we were blessed to have two healthy children, and um, it cemented us very early on. And I think it's helped us to minister to other people because it's amazing how many other people. Yeah, I think at one point, um, probably four or five years ago, was the first time I could say that I really started getting used to what normal was like because I hadn't experienced it in a long time. So before ministering to others, we decided to invite four generations, families out to live in our home. I think, you know, our tendencies are always to try to jump four or five levels. We're so passionate about the Lord. We want to run this and do this and change the world overnight. I think in that we've learned that you can compromise your relationship with the Lord, grinding for the Lord. And uh, don't push your own agenda before you put the Lord's agenda first and compromise that relationship. And so one thing at a time, and uh, sometimes you can't see the picture when you're in the frame, but the Lord can. My favorite part of a wedding is when the husband and the wife exchange the vows and they give to each other all that they have. So he gives to her all that he has and she gives to him all that she has. And that's a picture of the gospel. Because when I came to Christ, I wasn't dressed in white. Yeah, I was filthy. And all I had was debt, moral debt. And I gave to him all that I had, and it was awful. And he gave to me all, and so he took that. He died on the cross for my debt, my sin. And he gave to me all that he had his goodness and his righteousness and his forgiveness and his peace and his love. He gave to me all that he had. Just a beautiful picture of the gospel. And what marriage does is it, it's such a great gift and it surfaces all the selfishness in you. And you find out you need God more than ever. I want us to take a moment and just bow in prayer, whether you're single, whether you're married, just bow in prayer for a moment. And whatever God has put on your heart, whatever God has said to you this morning, just speak to him. If you need to say, God, I need you. God, I love you. God, please forgive me. God, I'm, you've spoken to me about one thing or several things. Just speak to God for just a moment. Just take this moment. Speak to him. Receive his forgiveness. Receive his strength. Receive his grace. Receive his love.